All right. Good morning, folks. Um, uh, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for the opportunity to come and speak with you folks. Um, I'm Monty Schmidt. I'm with the Nature Conservancy, and I'm doing this presentation with Linda McElwee from the Mendocino County Resource Conservation District. Um, is that, can you everybody hear me in the back? All right, good. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I'm sure all of you know, it takes water to go grapes, and uh, you need water to grow the grapes that make the fabulous wines that you folks make here in the region. And Linda and I are here to talk about uh, the work that we're doing to address a lot of the water management issues that are at play here in the region and some of the projects and strategies that we're implementing to make sure that there's sufficient water to continue to grow grapes and make great wines. Um, you know, so um, I, I'm going to talk about some of the um, some of the issues that are facing the region and some of the projects that we're doing, and then Linda's going to take over and talk about some of the work that the RCD is doing, as well as a joint project that we have together. And um, hopefully, and then we'll have some maybe some questions at the end. So, um, you know, as you, we all know that this year has been a good year in terms of rain, but we came out of four years of drought, so we know that. Water is something that is uncertain and that we're at risk when we have dry years, especially ones in sequence like we've had. Um, we don't have enough. And so that is not, that's the weather portion of it, but adding to that is um, we have a number of different threats that are kind of making water management in this area more challenging. The region is seeing an increase in population. A lot of folks have discovered how beautiful it is up here and more people are moving up. That increases the demand on water that is already at play with water for a lot of the agriculture in the area. And that's created a resource deficit for water in our streams that has really severely impacted our salmon fisheries. And, and this is an issue, frankly, throughout California, where over 50% of our uh, salmon runs are in danger of, um, of extinction in one form or the other. And so, um, added to that in this region, we have uh, the increase in cannabis cultivation, which is adding yet further demands on water in our streams. And added to that, we have the fact that we're, we've come out of a drought, but next year could be yet another drought. And we have climate change, which is predicted to increase the frequency and intensity of droughts throughout California. And our... Um, <coughs> Presentation's gotten out of order. Um, so, um, added to that, we've. Um, so anyway, um, so give me one second now to quickly figure out what's happened with my presentation. This is not the kind of thing to have happen right when you get up here. Okay. So anyway, um, we've basically, um, when it comes down to it, we have. Um, you know, what adds to the challenges of our water management issues in the area are actually our water rights. And so most folks probably know this, but water rights come in kind of two different kinds. There's riparian rights, which are usually associated with a property located right along a stream. And the, chal the challenging part about riparian rights is that you can't store the water. So that means that if you uh, have, are relying on your riparian right, you need to keep diverting that water all year round. The other kind of water right are appropriative rights, which usually have terms and conditions on the season you can divert and the total amount that you can take. Um, often the water rights, the appropriative water rights in this um, area are for water to be taken during the summertime, not in the wintertime when there's more water available, it rains a lot more. So um, added to that is we have both of these water rights are um, disincentivized sort of the um, more environmentally beneficial um, and conservation management practices because if you have a water right and say during the summertime you decide I don't need to take that much water I want to leave some water in the stream for, for fish or wildlife or water quality there is, um, there is a concern that by not using water that you're somehow or another abandoning it and you're at risk of losing it unless you somehow or another use some other form of, of formal agreement to protect that water right. So in, in some ways these water rights um, encourage people to use it for the thought that they'll lose it. And added to the challenge of water management in this region is the fact that unlike in the Central Valley where we have large dams that 
provide water for a, a very large population and area and in agricultural industries. Here, we have very decentralized water. We have a lot of individual pumps and streams and, and wells. And so it's not like um, you can just affect one dam operation. You really have to come up with um, solutions that address the fact that you have water coming from a range of different sources. So that takes talking with people in your watershed. And as most of you know, uh, when it comes to water, collaboration and talking constructively is not what California is known for. But um, oftentimes people have, uh, water issues have led to fighting, litigation, and a reliance on regulatory agencies to come in and regulate and fix things. And that pathway is very time consuming, it's expensive, it's confrontational, and no one ever seems to feel like they come out a winner in those situations. Um, and there's a better way to get things done. And that's where the Nature, Nature Conservancy has a lot of expertise. For more than 50 years, and in 50 states and more than 30 countries, we've been working with a wide array of different interests, from commercial fishermen to energy developers, timber companies to farmers, to protect and restore fresh water and lands and oceans. Because we know that when it comes to saving nature today, it depends as much on how we use our working lands and our rivers and oceans as it does to how we protect our parks. So our approach is about figuring out how to meet the needs of both people and nature. And, and our strategy is to be creative problem solvers, to use the best available science, and to work collaboratively with stakeholders to, reduce, to produce real on-the-ground benefits, like some of the projects that I'll talk about in a few minutes. We also effectively leverage existing laws, policies, and regulations to support projects, not to impede them. And we don't just plan, we believe in doing it. We manage lands, we build projects on the ground that provide real benefits, and we learn from the process of doing. We really want to make sure that not only what we do is effective, but we want to be smarter the next time we go at a project to make it cheaper, more effective, and easier to do. So why the Navarro? Um, we got involved in the Navarro because at the, at the top of it, we are very interested and concerned about fish. And we did a very detailed analysis, um, and the Nation Conservancy called the Sandscape Report, where we assessed the potential to restore coho and steelhead throughout California. And our assessment found that, that the Navarro ranked very high in the priority of being able to recover these species. And the reasons why are because if we can restore the, the stream flow, the remaining habitat will support um, a healthy fishery. And that there's also a tremendous opportunity for win-win projects because local stakeholders want improved water security, but they also care about having healthy rivers and having a thriving fishery. And they're also, because there are existing policies and tools that we can use today to implement projects. And lastly, because the Navarro is a great place for, um, for learning by doing. And that hopefully what we learn here can be used elsewhere in Northern California to help improve um, water security as well as flows for our fish. So at the very top of it, our driving concern was to understand coho and steelhead fish. And um, the Navarro used to be one of the most productive systems in the North Coast, and we believe it can be again. And so our work began by assessing fish populations and habitat conditions. And while our current populations right now are very low, the goal, the recovery goal, is much higher, and we think we can get there. The next thing we needed to do, beyond knowing the fish, was understanding the hydrology and, and to illuminate um, our understanding of what's going on out there. And so to do that, we installed um, 16 stream gauges throughout the watershed to look at where reaches of, the, of tributaries and the main stem are impaired for flow, uh, for low flow and high temperatures. And what we found is kind of typical of what you see in a lot of Mediterranean climates. We get a lot of our rainfall in the winter and spring, and then it's dry the rest of the year. And that top hydrograph, um, that image that you see at the top, it's called a hydrograph, and it shows a pictorial um, depiction of what um, of stream flows in um, through the spring and summer and fall months. And what you see at the left are the spikes that show when you get a storm event, flows go up in the stream, and then the, once the storm passes, the water comes back down. But what we see is when you move into the summer months, 
you see that that line goes very low and very um, close to the bottom. And that's basically when we get into our summer and fall seasons where there's no rainfall and our stream flows get very, very low. And then in that bottom graph, what you can see, that's a, that's a blown up image of just the summertime. And what you're seeing is that spiky line going up and down, that is the signature of pumps being turned on and off. And that's showing that, that even when we have that very low base flow period where there's very little water in the stream, we're seeing the impact of individual pumps, um, or cumulatively of pumps going on and off, further diminishing flows. And in some reaches, and particularly in the really dry years like we've come out of, those diversions can actually end up dewatering some streams. So the next thing we figured we needed to look at is how, what is the water need in the Navarro? So we did a water use analysis. And the overarching message is, the good news, is that there is enough water um, in the Navarro. Uh, right now, the, the, uh, um, the, over the co course of the year, there's more than enough water. We have over 240,000 acre feet of water that runs off in the watershed. And it's more than 100 times what we've estimated to be the human needs, the human uses of residential, agriculture, um, and other purposes. I'm having a little message box jumping up. Um, so the, the issue um, is not um, a matter of whether there's enough water. It's whether there's enough water at the times when we need it. And what we're seeing is that, in, is that of the 1,700 uh, acre feet of water that we need annually here, 80% um, of that is needed during the summertime. And so um, that's at the time when there's the least amount of water in our streams. It's at a time when we need that water most in our streams to be able to help um, fish make it through the hot, dry summers. So the solution is pretty obvious that we need to try to help work with, um, with water right holders to reduce their summer diversions and meet their needs using wa water from a wetter time of the year. And the challenge goes back to that fact that we have that very decentralized um, water supply sources, that there's a lot of different um, um, pumps and streams and wells. And so that requires um, applying a watershed approach that incentivizes individual water users to work together collectively to reduce summer diversions and improve stream flows for fish. So as part of our work in the Navarro with the Mendocino County RCD and Trout Unlimited, um, we're developing what we're calling our collaborative water management model. And we believe that by um, working with land water users who have the most to gain or lose, that we can work together um, to improve water management. And that we recognize that every water right holder has a unique set of circumstances um, that need to be addressed and that there's not a one-size-fits-all solution. So our collaborative water management approach is about providing technical guidance and support to, to water right holders to find the right tools and policies to help them improve their water security and stream flows. So when I talk about, um, about tools uh, or strategies, I'm talking about things like being able to shift the timing of diversion. So instead of taking water during the summertime, get a new water right and get some storage and you can take some water in, during the winter and spring and have that water for when you need it in the summertime. Or coordinating the timing of diversion. So if you're in the same watershed, if, if Bob diverts on odd days and Jane is diverting on even days, you're not diverting at the same time, so you're reducing your, your cumulative impacts. Or even just reducing the rate at which you're pumping. When we have really, really small flows during the summertime, if we can just throttle back pumps a little bit so that it's not taking all the flow but taking a smaller percentage, but you're pumping for a larger um, period of time, that can have an effect of leaving enough water in streams. Um, so, and in terms of tools, a lot of you folks are probably fairly familiar with them. Um, storage ponds and tanks, um, frost fans to avoid the need for water for frost use, um, things like that, that, and increasing efficiency, things that I think a lot of folks are already doing. These are all ways to reduce our water consumption and uh, rely less and less on our stream flows. And lastly, our, when I talk about different tools, we have policy tools. and, and um, they're not perfect, 
and we're trying to figure out ways to make them better, but there are existing policy and water right tools that can help water users achieve their goals to protect in-stream flows and improve water security. Things like the North Coast and Stream Flow Policy, which re was recently created a couple years ago, was specifically created for addressing the issues that we have in the North Coast of changing, getting a new water right to be able to take water in the wintertime and to be able to store it so that you can use it in the summer months. And then there's also things like 1707 permits, there, which kind of sounds technical, but it's a, it's, a, it's a way of taking water. If you are deciding to leave water in the stream, you can designate, get a 1707 permit, which um, dedicates that stream flow to leaving it in the stream, but it's also dedicating it to a use, and so there's no risk of, of it being abandoned or unclaimed. And there are other tools that can be used to help find the right solutions to help work with folks. But no matter how good our plans are, if we're not doing on-the-ground projects, things won't work. And so the Nature Conservancy and the Mendocino County RCD and Trout Unlimited, we have a track record of getting projects done. And I'm going to talk about some of them, and Linda will follow up with some more. Um, one of our first projects that we have done in, in the area is working with, um, in the Anderson Valley, is with Rotor Estates. Um, Arno and Bob have worked with us very patiently over the last couple of years to help um, them secure a new water right that will enable them to divert water in the wintertime when supplies are more reliable and to store it using their existing pond. And as part of the new water right, they are agreeing to not divert water flows in the summer via forbearance agreement, but protecting that water with a 1707 permit that will dedicate it for in-stream use. And while it's taken us a long time, a couple of years, to work through this process that we had hoped really we could do in, in kind of a little under two years, we've learned a lot from doing it, and we are learning lessons that can help us speed this up and do it faster in the future. Another project I'll talk about is an example that, that we haven't been involved with, but is a great example from um, this Westminster Woods project, which is a summer camp and conference center on Dutchville Creek in the Russian River watershed. It's a pretty complex project, but you use a lot of different tools of the kinds that I was talking about in terms of shifting their season of diversion with a new water right. They increased irrigation efficiency. They reduced a, a lot of um, grass area that they were irrigating, so they reduced their use. And they installed storage tanks and in order to hold over water to use it during the summertime. And even in the, the project was... Uh, largely completed a couple of years ago, and even this past couple of summers, they've been able to see a higher base flow of water in the stream during the summertime. So, with that, I'm going to hand this now over to Linda to talk about um, the Mendocino County RCD. Good morning, thank you. How's everybody? <laughs> Really happy to be here. Thank you so much for having us. And uh, I'm going to try and stay close to the mic so you can all hear me. Um, so the RCD, I think, is one of the best kept secrets in California, actually, in Mendocino County. Uh, resource conservation districts were special districts of the state. like Kind of like, uh, as we have here, the Community Services District, the CSD board. And uh, so we're a non-regulatory local public agency. We're a partner agency with NRCS and UC Cooperative Extension. Uh, NRCS is Natural Resource Conservation Service. You may uh, be familiar with them. They're a federal program. Their, their funding comes through the Farm Bill. Uh, our funding comes through federal and state competitive grants. And uh, we often uh, are able, we work together and are able to add value to each other's projects, but we also work independently. We assist land managers in implementing best management practices, uh, we call them BMPs, to develop drought and climate resilient landscapes. We have long standing landowner relationships and understand what the local resource issues are. For example, <clears throat> in the grant that we're going to be talking about in just a little bit, um, we have developed really innovative partnerships here in the Navarro watershed to address the critical low summer flows. We work collaboratively on a voluntary basis with landowners, agencies, and nonprofit organizations to address resource, issue, resource issues and to help landowners stay ahead of the regulatory curve. 
So the Navarro Watershed Restoration Plan came out in 1998, and uh, after that, the, the RCD, we hit the ground running and uh, began working to implement that plan. Uh, we've treated more than 90 miles of roads in the watershed. In the past year alone, uh, we've installed more than three miles of, of stream habitat enhancement projects with installing large woody debris, uh, which helps to build uh, pools and habitat for the fish. Uh, we're presently working on water use efficiency projects with local orchard and vegetable farmers, also through uh, public funding Prop 84. And uh, we also have a grant through, uh, it's called DROPS, Drought, Re Drought Response Outreach Program for Schools, uh, to install low impact development stormwater projects at both AV, or Anderson Valley schools, which include rainwater catchment tanks and rain gardens, installing uh, catchment basins to capture the runoff from the parking lots uh, to treat the stormwater before it goes into the stormwater drain system and into the creeks. And uh, these will all be planted with native plants and pollinator-friendly plants. So Anderson Valley uh, wine growers have uh, been leaders in environmentally friendly farming practices. We have a very strong connection to place here, and we continue to develop better and better practices. These are some of the examples of water conservation practices that are being conducted in the watershed. Um, so we have rainwater captured and collected in farm ponds, like Penny Royal is doing, and uh, plant, develop that into their plan and their development of the, the whole uh, facility. We also, uh, wineries are utilizing stream technology in wineries to reduce their water use, like Balo and Goldeneye, and I think uh, perhaps Handley Cellars, there's others in the valley as well using this. Uh, wastewater recycling strategies, Goldeneye uh, is utilized this and also developed that in their development of their facility and their LEED certified winery. And um, also we have micro sprayers for frost protection, which Norman Kobler and Arts Rooney Vineyard Management are utilizing on about 80 plus acres of grapes. We have uh, presently two really super exciting grant opportunities that I think you'll be interested to learn more about. Uh, this one, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide and try and upload a lot of this information to you. It's a, a grant called Climate Beneficial Vineyard Management. It's through uh, the California Department of Fish, um, Food and Agriculture. It's a specialty crop block grant. The goal of the project is to enhance the competitive advantage of Northern California wine growers to compete for public funding for greenhouse gas reduction funds and to help vineyards become more drought and climate resilient. The grant is for Mendocino, Sonoma, and Napa counties. In Mendocino County, we're working with NRCS and UC Cooperative Extension and Mendocino Wine Growers uh, Incorporated to um, these partnerships are expanding and we welcome more involvement. The grant includes assistance to landowners and land managers to get funding to help become more resilient. There's, uh, for an example, there's this called SWEEP funding, which is the State Water Enhancement and Efficiency Program. And again, these are greenhouse gas reduction funds that are to help, uh, there's a water use efficiency and water conservation projects. And so we will be uh, receiving funding to help wine growers implement some of these practices and uh, obtain funding to do so. We're conducting our first carbon farm plans just now uh, with several vineyards in the county, and there's one here in the Anderson Valley with uh, Farrington Vineyards. We are also, uh, there's a, basically creating, it's a soil health hub. This is the North Coast Soil Health Hub. We're the first one in the state to be developing this alongside with uh, NRCS and UC Cooperative Extension, as I said. And, um, <clears throat> We're going to be, that website is uh, soilhub.landsmart.org, and that's going to be going live by the middle of next week. So this is also a two-year grant, and we're, in, we're just beginning it. Uh, we're probably about six months in, so you want to maybe follow our project as it continues to develop. Um, <clears throat> we've developed a survey. That I really would like you to know about this. We've developed a survey uh, to... Sorry, um, vineyard, for vineyard managers to fill out. The purpose of the survey is to capture the range of soil health practices currently in use 
uh, or barriers to their adoption. The site will include an online farmer-to-farmer forum, information about workshops and events, and information on soil health and climate beneficial vineyard management practices. There are opportunities to have self, uh, soil health assessments done. We're also having field demonstration trials. Also one of those is here in the Anderson Valley at Farrington Vineyards. And so we'll be holding workshops and demonstrations. We just had a workshop last Friday on conservation tillage workshop for vineyard uh, managers uh, at the Hopland Research and Extension Center at their demonstration vineyard. It's very well attended and we'll be doing more of those. And uh, if you stay tuned to the website, you can learn about those events as they come up and uh, as we uh, get further into this grant. And we do hope you fill out that survey. <clears throat> Especially all your great wine, the vineyard managers here, we want to know what practices you're doing and what your obstacles are for implementing new practices. So a second grant. This is what we're really um, with the, working with with the Nature Conservancy and Trout Unlimited. <clears throat> uh, we've teamed up to develop this planning project to help address critical low summer flows and to refocus priorities in the watershed. As I mentioned, uh, the restoration plan for the watershed is now 19 years old, and uh, coho and steelhead weren't even listed yet. And especially after the five years of extreme drought, drought, we need to update the plan to address climate as well as drought resilience. We are going to be developing five to eight priority projects to enhance the summer stream flows. And we have two years to complete the project, and we are already uh, in year one. We've completed year one. We've reviewed nine plans, those are restora nine restoration plans. Uh, we've put together a technical advisory group that is made up of stakeholders from the watershed, agency representatives, and nonprofit organizations. We're going to be having three meetings over the two years. We've had one already, it was very successful last November, and with another one scheduled for late summer or fall. The three types of projects we're looking at in this grant uh, that are the water storage and forbearance. Uh, just with that, for, forbearance is like you forbear uh, your diversion or pumping during like a, a forbearance agreement. You agree to forbear pumping during that season, that time of the year, late summer in particular, maybe July through uh, September, October. And um, large, installing large wood into the streams to help build uh, pool habitat for the fish and give them cover and stratify the cool temperatures. And also infiltration and groundwater projects. The main goal is to address climate change and drought resilience uh, considerations. With TNC and Trout Unlimited scientific expertise, we've looked at water needs, water rights and use, identified reaches that are in, uh, impaired for flow and temperature, fisheries and riparian habitat conditions. All of that analysis has been put into a prioritized table to help guide our outreach and project development. Uh, once again, the project types, as I mentioned, are the storage and forbearance, the large wood, uh, and infiltration projects uh, to replenish the groundwater. And for example, we're gonna, for uh, like an infiltration project may look like um, a um, infiltration pond where it's just slowly seeping back down into the groundwater or strategic slash packing of our gullies. Basically, we're looking at all ways on a watershed level to slow, spread, sink, and store our winter abundant water resources and strategies for limiting dependence on summer flows. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Monty. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just a couple more slides. So, um, so our collaborative water management model. Um, this is another key piece of our uh, our work together under this grant. And um, it, it, as as I said kind of earlier and pretty simply, it's just really about trying to figure out ways that folks who live in a watershed can work together and how we can help provide some of the technical resources, our understanding about policies and water rights, but ultimately it's really not something that can just be done with one landowner and call it success. It really does take a collaborative effort of folks within a watershed because 
the diversions are small um, removals of water, and, and, and that's what is bringing the flows down in the summertime and, and depleting that summertime habitat that's really critical for, for steelhead and coho. Some of you may not um, know, but the, the, the juveniles of those two runs spend the whole summer in, in the stream. Unlike some fish where the, the uh, salmon, the juveniles, move out to the sea and they grow out in the ocean, these two species spend the whole summer in the streams, and so that means that they've got to have enough habitat. And they don't really need much. It's kind of shocking how little they can survive on, but they can't survive in a dry stream. And it's really important to at least have enough water that there's a connectivity between the pools. And so our, our objectives aren't really big volumes of water per se. They're just at the right time and at just enough level. And so we really want to figure out how to um, advance that and achieve that through this collaborative management approach. And so to do that, you know, we're, we're um, looking to develop this model and we understand, we know where the tools are, but we need to understand and work on better how to create this framework that brings people together and incentivizes folks to work together and to provide technical guidance and agreement structures and, um, and just communication tools um, how do people within a watershed effectively communicate when some people may use the internet and some people may not. Some people may only use the telephone for the most part. So we've got to figure out ways to work with people for where they are and the way that they get things done. And um, we're also looking at financial and regulatory incentives because when it comes down to it, um, this is in the interest of not just the people here, but it's also in the interest of, of California, frankly, that we want to have strong we want to have a, a vibrant um, agricultural community here, and we also want to have a vibrant fishery that supports commercial fishermen that, that live elsewhere, and frankly, you know, people like to eat salmon. And so that's something that's in the interest of all Californians. And so there's, there are financial incentives, but there also need to be regulatory incentives that help people do the right thing so that they want to, because I think for the most part, people do. Um, and then we're also really trying to focus on how we can learn here and make sure that we're doing it elsewhere because um, it's not just the, on the shoulders of the Navarro or the Russian or the Matol or other watersheds to, to achieve recovery of these species. It's, it's, on, it's on a very big region, and so we need to figure out a strategy and a solution that applies across a big piece of the landscape. So I'll just conclude by going through sort of a what's next and, um, and maybe um, how we can appeal to you for some help. Um, as Linda mentioned, we're, we're going to be identifying those five to eight long-term projects that we're going to be do, doing preliminary design work for. But in the near term, um, the RCD and TNC are also looking to um, identify maybe some low-hanging fruit. So we're looking for maybe some projects that we could actually do in the next year. And that's not a very, um, uh, that's not a long time, to be honest. And so we're, we're trying to find some projects, whether they're, they're storage or rainwater capture. Um, there's a number of different um, things that we can do. But if folks here have any ideas, come and see us because we have, um, we have some time and some funding and we'd love to, to do some more good work in the watershed. And, and I'll lastly say, just if you live or you have land in the in the watershed, and you think that there is some, and you have some interest in trying to find ways to reduce your summertime diversions, um, please come and talk to us. We'd love to be a resource to help out. So that's it. Um, thank you very much, and we have some time for questions. If anybody's curious or wants to find out, otherwise we'll be in the back and we can we can answer questions later. Good morning, thank you. I have two questions. Um, the first one is about the uh, change in administration and environmental policies in Washington, if that's going to affect the funding and regulatory opportunities that you guys have, both on the private side, um, Conservancy, and on the public side, Linda. And then the second question is, can you give us a feel for how Mendocino County is doing relative to other coastal counties with this kind of thing, stream flow diversity? There's water and wineries pretty much all the way down the coast, nearly to Mexico. If you could help us understand where Mendocino stands in the bigger picture, if we ahead, behind, something like that, that'd be great. You can take the first half and take the second. Okay. Um, 
Um, the federal question, uh, boy, we, that happened, that's a question a lot of us have been uh, wrestling with. Fortunately, in here, I, I, I don't think that the, the, the federal administration really is a significant um, determiner of, of what we can get done. A lot of, um, of the, the policies, the, the laws and the policies that I've been talking about are mostly related to state um, um, laws and, and regulations. And um, so I, I think that that's unlikely to change. If anything, I think really there is actually a very strong commitment um, and awareness within the state administration and the state agencies about just how important this region is and what a priority it is in terms of not only resources but um, a desire to see things succeed because we're not, in some ways, we're not as complicated as the Central Valley, and which is very um, a very tough environment to get things done because everything is so interconnected. Water from Northern California is water supply for Southern California, so it's very difficult to get things done. Whereas this is seen, I think, as a as a bright spot in the state where things can can be achieved. And the the North Coast and Stream Flow Policy, I think, reflects that desire to see that wow, if we can help landowners to get a new water right that allows them to take water in the wintertime when there's so much more water available and to store that, that that's a pretty, that's a relatively simple thing that can be done that can have a really big difference. Uh, just to add to that question, um, so a lot of our funding uh, is through public funds and so for some of the grants that we work on at the RCD right now, I mentioned Prop 84, but the Wildlife Conservation Board grant that we have through uh, the Flow Enhancement Grant that we're doing the, the, with the Nature Conservancy and Trout Unlimited is through Prop 1 and that was the water bomb that we passed in 2014. So uh, California voters have, feel like this is a strong, they feel strongly about this and voted for it, thankfully. And so those monies are now being distributed through grant funds, uh, through different state agencies, Wildlife Conservation Board, uh, State Coastal Conservancy, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, et cetera. Uh, those funds are making their way back down onto the ground, out to the ground. Also with that, we have in California, AB 32, which was passed in 2010, which is the Climate Action Bill, which is where the greenhouse gas reduction funds are now coming from through the fee, their fees to the polluters, essentially. And so that money is going into a fund and putting, being put back out into the ground for climate beneficial practices in both transportation, any, any uh, forestry uh, beneficial uh, agriculture is now seen as part of the solution because we can sequester carbon in the soil. And also, uh, the added benefit of that is that that helps with the water holding capacity of your soil as well. So it's both drought and climate resilience there. And your second question was? Okay, so Mendocino County is, well, I, I know mostly about more familiar with the Navarro, and so I can speak to that um, mostly. The, we're in the Central California Coast, Coho. Uh, it's called an evolutionary significant unit, not to get too geeky on you, but uh, this ESU. And uh, the Navarro is considered a stronghold for the, the CCC um, populations. And uh, Mendocino County and our coastal watersheds, we are... We are there are definitely challenges with flows in that late summer time all across the whole state, basically. So that is a, a common problem throughout, and we are working with partnering watersheds. The Matoll is doing a lot of work on uh, putting together, uh, they're way ahead of us in some ways, on uh, doing storage and forbearance, and these voluntary coordinated diversion modeling models, and also down in Sonoma County. It's called the Coho Partnership, and that's a whole collaborative, many agencies and non, um, non-profit organizations and RCDs working together to, uh, they've chosen the Russian as a, sort of a, a blueprint for that. Uh, and you could probably speak a little bit better to the Russian, perhaps, or the, that, that partnership, the Coho Partnership. I mean, maybe that's enough said. Is it, I mean, I think when it comes down to it, when it, for... For the North Coast region, the Navarro and, and I think the Russian and the Matol are all doing really important work, and 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 the Eel, um, and but there's more regions of the state that are, are a little bit more off the grid that aren't quite as much of a focus, and that's where 
having these places be the incubators for great ideas makes us leaders. And so that's an exciting part of, of the work that we're doing. I could just add there that we have wild runs of Steelhead and Coho, which is pretty extraordinary. So, and we want to work and help the habitat. The habitat is the fish are here. We want to increase the habitat for them. It's good to have you uh, here. We've attended uh, several years in a row and seen portions of the presentation. And the question I have is really about increase in storage. It's such a common sense approach that you're describing. But do you have any statistics that has, has storage increased as the diversions during winter and putting it into storage? Have you observed an increase in that? Can you uh, give a statistic on how that's working? Um, I, I'm not, I, it, it is increasing. I don't know if I have a, an exact statistic for you, but uh, NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, through their EQIP, sorry, it's a little bit like alphabet soup in our industry. So uh, EQIP is Environmental Quality Incentive Program. It's a, a program that comes through the Farm Bill to help landowners implement uh, practices and conservation practices. So they have, um, they've built a lot of ponds, this off spent, these off-stream storage ponds. So getting people off stream uh, and, so, and with an appropriative water right to get the water from the creeks in the winter time has increased exponentially. I think it is becoming, you know, they see that as a real solution. The agencies, uh, the funders, everybody feels like this is, this is a, uh, a win-win for everybody. Yeah, a few years ago, there was a, a spent a considerable amount of time talking about diversion for illegal diversions for pot growing and the tributaries. And I'm just wondering if you have one any better handle on how large that is, whether it's gotten worse, the same, better. A <laughs> um, uh, couple things. Uh, has it gotten worse? Yes. I mean, the the, um, the amount of cannabis cultivation that's been going on in the North Coast is, has has skyrocketed, and it's you know I don't think it would be unreasonable to call it almost kind of crisis proportion in terms of how rapidly it's occurring and the impacts of it, and it's and we're not talking just uh, the impacts of of illegal water diversion, but we're also talking about um, pesticide and herbicide and, and uh, runoff and um, sediment runoff into our streams um, and loss of habitat is a sort of a patchwork of, of um, things that are being put on to the landscape. The, the good news about this is that through um, recent legislation around recreational marijuana and, and medical marijuana um, cultivation, there are regulations that are coming online very soon um, that it, that'll allow this to occur in a more permitted and more rational way where there'll be restrictions about about how water can be diverted and there'll be best management practice requirements that will help reduce um, sediment runoff and the use of herbicides and pesticides in, in, in unsafe ways. So I think that the regulation of the industry will bring um, bring better safeguards, they'll probably will still be, um, there will probably still be illegal diversions and, and unpermitted um, growing will probably still occur, but um, absent some sort of uh, guidance that there hasn't been really much to, to date, um, that's not health thing. So it's headed, I think, in the right direction, but it's a, it's a daunting challenge that's up ahead and, and um, it's one that we're, that we're concerned about and we're working on as well. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Very appreciated.